So Father God, we want to thank you that you're a God who speaks to us today. Thank you that you're a God who is alive and real. Thank you, Lord God, for your presence with us. Thank you that you speak to us by your Holy Spirit. And you also speak to us through the Word of God, the Bible. And Lord, help us to have eyes and ears just open to hear and to see what you want to say to us this morning from this, yeah, difficult passage from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. But Lord, I thank you that you want to speak to us through it, and I pray that we will, uh, you will help us to teach us and come and be our teacher now, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you must think, Matthew, goodness me, what on earth Bible reading was that that we've just had? Visions of beasts coming out of the sea and rivers of fire and goodness knows, just about everything happening. Um, And for those that haven't been here with us, uh, we're looking at the book of Daniel. and This is our seventh week, actually, so we've done Daniel chapter 1 to 6. Let me just give you a quick, very quick uh, update on what's happened. Daniel chapter 1, Daniel is a, he's a, a Jewish young man, probably about 16 years old, and he's, he's taken from, and we're talking about 2,000, uh, nearly 600 years ago, he's taken from Israel all the way to Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq, as an exile, and he's very bright, and he's trained up in the ways of uh, the Babylonian court. Then in chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar, who's this ruthless dictator, ruler of Babylon, he is, um, has a dream, and he demands that people both interpret the dream and, and, uh, give, and, and tell him what dream he had. Daniel does that for him. Then in Daniel chapter 3, we were thinking about the, the fiery furnace that Nebuchadnezzar had for anybody who wouldn't bow down and worship his statue. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are put in this fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar looks and he sees Jesus with those three guys in the furnace. Then in Daniel chapter 4, we see this radical conversion of Nebuchadnezzar, this superpower king who is suddenly behaves like a wild animal for seven years. And then he, he looks up to heaven and he has an encounter with God. And Nebuchadnezzar, this superpower ruler, uh, suddenly becomes converted and starts following the living God. Then in Daniel chapter 5, we have Belshazzar's feast, the time when another king's on the throne. And he is, he's taken out by the Medes and the Persians who've just invaded Babylon. And we see the, here about the writing on the wall and his number is up. And then last week in Daniel chapter 6, we were thinking about Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel, at the age of probably 85 plus, is lowered into this lion's den, but actually God protects him and he's safe all night long and uh, he keeps trusting God. So that's what we've had, but now let me tell you, if you are a student of the book of Daniel, there are 12 chapters. The first six chapters are the ones we've just had. From chapter 7 to chapter 12, everything changes. So we don't have the narrative, the stories of what's happening in the king, different kingdoms at the time. We actually have a lot of theology. We have a lot of revelation that comes from God to Daniel. And so that's why Daniel chapter 7 is a complete change about in its, uh, the way it is. And you think, Matthew, what's, what's that all about? Well, let me tell you. I'm going to try and give three Three keys, three hinges on which you can, hooks on which you can better understand Daniel chapter 7. And that is really understanding it as we look at it in a moment. We'll see that it talks about the kingdoms of this world. It talks about the kingdom of Satan, of darkness. And it talks about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. So there are three different kingdoms we see all operating, and it's a bit like a cosmic battle going on uh, here. And what Daniel has, he has this, God gives him, and indeed us, an incredible revelation of a timeline of history from his own day, 553 years BC, all the way to the second coming of Jesus, which is an event still to happen. And in Daniel chapter 7, there's a, like an overview of history. It's almost God's timeline. And we see particularly two different types of history that are you know, sort of recorded here. We see one history, which is a history from the standpoint of Earth, from the standpoint of planet Earth, from the standpoint of human beings. And we see another history from the standpoint of, standpoint of God and from heaven and eternity. So Daniel 7 gives us an insight into both. So if you're glazing over already, then 
Go back and have a look at Daniel chapter 7 yourself and actually read it when you have a little bit more time as well. But that's what's basically happening. Daniel chapter 7 and indeed the rest of the chapters, there are some people who love to put on all sorts of ridiculous interpretations to it. They have very particular uh, way of understanding prophecy in a very literal way and they will tell you everything that's happened and everything that's going to happen and God doesn't need to tell you anymore because he can tell you for it. Let me tell you, that's not the way to understand it. We need to be very, use good hermeneutics in understanding what actually is the scriptures saying to us and we need to be careful that we don't just get into speculation. If you Google Daniel chapter 7, you get all sorts of crazy ideas and crazy uh, speculations about the end of the world and goodness knows what else. But actually, what I'm going to do is just take an overview of what this chapter is about and we can understand it in three kingdoms, the kingdoms of the world, and and let's start off with that one, the the, the kingdoms of the world are temporary. That is the first point. The kingdoms of the world are temporary. That is what Daniel chapter 7 screams out at us, but it does it in an interesting way. It says in verse 3, it says, Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. You think, wow, that's a crazy dream or vision to have. Four beasts coming out of, out of the sea. Let me tell you, God wants to speak to us, and he'll speak to us through the Bible. He'll speak to us through the Holy Spirit. Occasionally, he'll speak to us through a dream or through a vision. And Daniel's vision is probably a combination of he's asleep, dream, dreaming, but in his, his dream, he has a vision of God speaking to him. And he sees these four beasts coming out of the sea. What's this all about? Well, let me tell you, the four beasts represent four kingdoms. And most Bible scholars will agree that these are them. The first one that Daniel sees a lion coming out of the sea. And these aren't nice beasts. These aren't, oh, there's a nice lion, let's give it a stroke. These are beasts. These are unpleasant. They're, they're not good. And the first, the first one, the lion, represents the empire of Babylon. That was uh, from about, well, it was actually from 605 to 536 AD, a long time ago. lasted for about 70 years. It was an incredible empire in its day. Didn't last for long, but it was incredible while it lasted. Uh, it wasn't particularly good. It was very occult and it was very uh, ungodly, but lots of amazing things happened during that Babylonian empire. Then the second beast that he sees is a bear. A bear that's got three ribs in its mouth. Um, and it says in verse 5, and there, was, there before me was a second beast which looked like a bear. And the bear refers to the empire of the Medes and the Persians, which came in uh, when King Belshazzar is, is uh, taken out and lasts for nearly 300 years, actually, the Medan Persian Empire. It was a powerful empire, dominated um, that whole area of the, the Middle East and uh, the Near East. Then after that, Daniel sees, a, and this is God giving Daniel a, a timeline of history. He then sees a leopard coming out of the sea. What does that represent? The leopard represents the Greek Empire. Alexander the Great in 331 BC conquered the then known world. He actually didn't live long himself. He died young in his early 30s. But the empire lasted for a long time, uh, probably around 200 years or so. The Greek Empire was dominant. And then there's a fourth beast. And this fourth beast is the one that Daniel is particularly finds difficult. He's a terrifying beast. In fact, Daniel can't even find an animal to describe him because this beast that's coming out of the sea is is not a good beast and it's got iron teeth. I don't think there's any animal that's got iron teeth. Uh, It's got iron teeth and this is what it says. It says in verse 7, After that I looked and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. What does that represent? Well, God's giving Daniel, an an insight into the future and seeing this is the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire. And you might think, Matthew, this is crazy. What's all of these things about beasts and this sort of thing? Daniel is is using what is a genre of literature which is called apocalyptic. And so often, to understand it, we need to understand a little bit of understanding of the prophetic. And we need to understand that actually, instead of writing it in clear English, it's going to be written in symbols and numbers and codes. And that's why it needs careful understanding to get it right. 
But what is, what is God saying loudly through this passage and through these points I'm making here is that worldly kingdoms come and go. Worldly kingdoms are only ever temporary. There have been these four kingdoms that were powerful in their time. They became huge empires, some of them for a shorter period of time, some of them for a longer period of time, but none of them lasted for very long. Always there was the next ruthless empire, the next ruthless king, the next ruthless dictator ready to take over as soon as there was any sign of weaknesses in the, uh, the, 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 the previous nation or, or empire. So here we see that the power of worldly kingdoms and worldly rulers is always ever temporary. And that, in essence, is what God wants us to stand from all these pictures of beasts and things coming out of the sea. In a way, it, it's straightforward. Interestingly, none of these worldly kingdoms are commended. They're each described as a beast. That's not a compliment. Um, all of them sought to dominate the people that they ruled. Nebuchadnezzar did. Uh, the Medes and Persians did. The Greeks did. The Romans did. Uh, they seek to dominate and oppress the people that they led. They were wicked. They were ungodly empires. And you might think, okay, well, that's history, Matthew. What about today? Well, I'm not going to make any political points, but even if we just look at the world headlines at the moment, China wants, China wants to dominate and control as much as it can. So does Russia. We see that with a war against Ukraine. It, its empire isn't quite big enough. We want to have the empire that we used to have, and so we're going to invade Ukraine. Um, we see it in, in Myanmar, just on our doorstep, with generals who want to <clears throat> seize control of power. And uh, we see it in, in most Muslim nations that want to, to control their nation. You can only worship Islam. You can't worship any other god. And we see it in communist nations. Communism, that's a way that you know, the, you know, things have got to be, and uh, again, all of them fairly ruthless, fairly straight in the way that they deal. And actually, I have to say, increasingly in a number of democratic nations, we're seeing increasingly uh, elements of perhaps much less democratic than ever things were before. And many, and most of the nations, both in history and in the present, and let me tell you in the future, they're basically seeking power, they're seeking to control, they're seeking to dominate. Uh, if you look at the history of the world, there is a huge amount of death and destruction, killings, and much of it is, is sad history to read. But actually, here, da God is describing to Daniel empires, kingdoms, nations being ruled independently of God, without God, no mention of God or following um, you know, the, the, the creator God of the universe. And they're almost always they're described as beasts. And who are these beasts? Well, they're individuals. They could be nations. At times, they could be institutions um, that appeared in Daniel's day, but also keep reappearing in our day and into the future. So, and then also biblical prophecy. What do we need to understand about biblical prophecy? Well, it's important that we understand biblical prophecy prophecy accuracy, accurately, and we don't just only take it very literally because a pure literal interpretation will not give you the full meaning. So here we see the four beasts um, refer to specific empires, but it's frequently the case with biblical prophecy. There's a meaning in the context at the time, but there's also a relevance for us now too. Much of biblical prophecy will have a, both a context to it, but also a, a wider and deeper understanding and meaning to it as well. And um, this is just one of those uh, such prophecies. Because the beasts of the empires that happened historically, they're typical of present and future you know, human condition as well. And how does the Bible tell us to deal with worldly authorities? Well, it's clear we need to respect um, worldly authorities. We need to pray for kings and emperors and dictators and whoever they might be, whether you think they're great or whether we don't, whether we voted for them or whether we didn't. We need to be respectful. We need to, to be serving God well. And Daniel gives us the example. I'm going to make it a point later. How to serve God well in a difficult empire. Be faithful to God. That's the lesson we learned from Daniel. And Jesus said in Mark 12, he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, or in other words, give to the worldly kingdoms what the worldly kingdoms should have, 
and give to God what is God's. And as Christians, we need to be really careful that we don't make the mistake of giving Caesar, giving the world, what should be given to God alone. So that's the first overall point. The kingdom of the world are temporary. They were in the past, they are now, they will be in the future until Jesus comes and we will see the end of history as we've, we know it. So that's what we get here, an overline, a timeline, if you like, of history from Daniel's time right to the, the second coming of Jesus. So we looked a little bit briefly at the first kingdom. Second kingdom, the kingdom of Satan will be destroyed. That's the second point that comes really clearly from Daniel chapter 7. The kingdom of Satan will be destroyed. Verses 24 and 25 say this. It says, after them, that's the first four kings, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress the saints and try to change set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. So here we see, we've seen the history that was happening at Daniel's time, and here we're looking into the future and we're looking at the very last um, empire that, w- that will dominate, um, the last kingdom on earth, uh, which appears to be worse than any of the ones that have gone before. And this can be described, if, if you like, the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of Satan. And I'm going to explain what the Antichrist is so you can understand. We don't have, if you like, far-fetched or weird understandings of it, but actually we have just a, a straightforward biblical understanding of it. So there's this king or this little horn as described in Daniel's uh, revelation that represents, if you like, the last world ruler. And this person is referred to as, as the Antichrist. But let me tell you, when we come to the Antichrist, yes, the Bible is clear that there will come a time where there will be one particular, if you like, final Antichrist, um, probably world ruler or something of that form. But it's not just a future thing. The spirit of the Antichrist has been at work right throughout human history. And we see the spirit of the Antichrist in all sorts of different ways. And... Here, we see that the, in the, 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 this form of the Antichrist is being boastful. He's blaspheming. He's, he's speaking against God's laws. He's speaking against the Most High. He doesn't have God's heart at all. The opposite. And let me tell you, this will help us to understand the Antichrist. The word Christ actually means anointed one. The word Christian actually means little anointed ones. So the anti-Christ is anti the anointing, anti-Jesus, anti-God. The word anti means opposed to, uh, in opposition to. And we see here in in the the revelation to Daniel that this particular anti-Christ is is, uh, speaking terrible things about the creator God of the universe, wants to have nothing to do with Jesus, wants to have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. But don't let this make the mistake of thinking that Antichrist is only a future thing. Yes, it is, but actually also the spirit of the Antichrist has been at work throughout the history of the world. And, um, and we see it in, in lots of different nations, and we, we see it in uh, the different nations that Daniel has already referred to. And so the, the spirit of the Antichrist, if you like, is an evil spirit that's at work behind human rulers, behind often human organizations, that basically is in opposition to Jesus. It doesn't want to have anything to do with the kingdom of God. It actually wants to to prioritize the kingdom of Satan. And um, these ten horns point to many antichrists, of which there will be one that will be particularly um, perhaps bad at the end. And let me just share a scripture. 1 John 2 verse 18 is helpful here. This is John who wrote the gospel gospel of John and also the letters. Uh, three letters in the Bible, and he says, as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, future event, even now many Antichrists have come. So we shouldn't be surprised when we see uh, a force at work which is really opposed to anything to do with the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the creator. So that's just a little bit of backdrop. And I'm sorry that this 
sermon is a little bit different from others. We've got to do a bit of theology today and wrestle with a bit of theology. And um, actually, I don't apologize for doing that, but maybe it's a little bit different from perhaps some um, other talks that uh, might more typically be given. A, a lot of preachers will probably avoid preaching on this passage at all because it's, um, it's uh, not always the most straightforward one to unpack. So, the days of evil are numbered, the kingdom of Satan is numbered, and the wonderful thing is that we see that actually the kingdom of Satan has been completely defeated. Two thousand years ago, Jesus Christ, God came from heaven to earth in the person of Jesus. He was God in a human body. If people sometimes say, Matthew, what is God like? What does he look like? Look at Jesus, you're looking at God. And 2,000 years ago, God lived on this earth in the form of Jesus for 33 years. He preached, what did he preach? He didn't preach the kingdom of the world. He didn't preach the kingdom of Satan. He preached the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And that was Jesus' preaching and teaching, pointing us, if you read the gospels, you'll read it for yourself. And then at the end of his life, he was nailed to a cross. He took upon himself the sin of the whole world, including my sin and your sin, the sin of the whole world. He rose from the dead because he is God, conquered death, conquered sin, conquered Satan once and for all at the cross. So although we read about these things happening in the book of Daniel, we need to have confidence as Christians that actually Jesus at the cross has defeated completely the power of death, the power of Satan, the power of sin. And that's why the good news of Christianity, it might sound like this is Daniel chapter 7 is bad news, it's good news because at the cross Jesus defeated all of those things, including Satan. And and for anyone who puts their faith in Jesus, we can be sure of having a relationship with God, a personal relationship with him that begins here on earth and will last forever. But even though Jesus 2,000 years ago died upon the cross, yes, we can know something of the kingdom of heaven now, and I don't want to get on to my next point, last point, but will in a moment, but actually we can have confidence in all that we're hearing about Daniel. And not only was Satan defeated at the cross 2,000 years ago, and the kingdom of Satan defeated, but also when Jesus returns at the second coming of Jesus, there will be a final and forever end to world history as we've known it. There will be an end to the worldly kingdoms as we've known them. There'll be an end to the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan. And there will be really leading into my next and final point, uh, the kingdom of heaven. So let's go on to the third point, and the third point, which is this. The kingdom of God will last forever. I said we can understand Daniel 7 with three kingdoms. The kingdom of the world, we've had a quick look at that. The kingdom of Satan, we've had a quick look at that. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Let's just read what it says here. Verse 13 and 14. It says, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Wow. Daniel has these two incredible revelations. In verses 9 to 10, Daniel has a revelation of... God the Father. And what is God the Father doing in heaven? God the Father is sitting on the throne. He's in the command and control center. He is in control. He's on the throne. He's God Almighty. And Daniel gets a little glimpse of God Almighty in these verses. Amazing. Look at them yourself. Verses 9 and 10. Incredible. And also, Daniel gets a glimpse of Jesus. And we see that in um, verses 13 and 14. Daniel gets a glimpse of Jesus. 500 years, even before Jesus came to earth, Daniel saw Jesus in, in that vision. He also saw Jesus in the lion's den when God came to protect him from the lions. But uh, twice he's Jesus. And the kingdom of heaven for a Christian is both now and future. The kingdom of God is a spiritual reign where of Jesus now over all who belong to him 
And it's a future kingdom that God has prepared for, the, for, for his people. And that will come in fully when Jesus returns. So, Daniel gets a glimpse of heaven. And the amazing thing about the kingdom of God, unlike the kingdom of the world, unlike the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of God is pure. The kingdom of God is holy. The kingdom of God, there is no sin. There is no pain. There is no crying. There is no weeping. There is no darkness. It's perfection because it's to be restored to God again. As in the very beginning of creation, so there was a perfect relationship. The kingdom of heaven is that perfect relationship with God that can begin here on earth but will last forever for those who will completely put their trust in Jesus. And that is what the Bible, what Jesus taught about the kingdom of heaven. So these three kingdoms all seem to be interacting and, uh, in, in Daniel chapter 7 and, and in fact for other chapters in the book as well. But the kingdom of God will last forever. And let me tell you this. This is the good news of Christianity. I'm sorry I've had to give quite a bit of technicality to, to get, get us to the point of understanding. But the good news of Jesus is that he wants every member of the human race with him in heaven for eternity. That's good news. Me, you, everyone. Past, present, future. Jesus wants all of us to be with him in eternity. He's created the kingdom of God and that relationship with God alone for us to have. The, we have the option of saying yes or we have the option of rejecting Jesus. I, I rejected Jesus for 21 years of my life, really. Uh, I didn't want Jesus in my life. And, and I, I was probably no better than these worldly leaders. And you know, I was opposing. I was reject, well, I wasn't hostilely opposing, but I didn't want Jesus in my life for the first 21 years of my life. But when the kingdom of God comes upon a person's life, when the person of the Holy Spirit, when the person of Jesus takes hold of a person, everything changes. We saw that in Nebuchadnezzar as he goes from seven years of madness and eating, you know, being like a donkey almost, to actually having a real encounter with the living God. And so the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is the kingdom that God wants you and I to focus upon. And in a way, that's my last point, is prioritize the kingdom of God. Prioritize the kingdom of God. And three times, here's, I've just written it once, but three times in Daniel chapter 7, it says, the court was seated and the books were opened. God wants you to be with him in heaven so much. He loves every person so much. There's not a person on earth that has lived, is living, will ever live that Jesus hasn't died on the cross for and doesn't love as fully as it's possible for God to love a person. And that is powerful. But we have a choice. Are we going to go the way of the, we'll see the, the worldly kingdoms as the way, the truth, the life, the answer to everything? Yes, we need to be committed to them. Yes, we need to serve. Daniel spent 70, 75 years as a civil servant in the Babylonian occult empire. So yes, we need to do all we can. But as we look at Daniel, we see a man who is faithful to his God and put God above the worldly or satanic empires. He put his life on the line by not bowing down and praying to the king and therefore going into the lion's den. And that's what God calls us to do as well. As Christians, yes, we serve God. We serve you know, our nation and, and, you know, as well as we can. But there's one kingdom that trumps all of the others, and that is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And God wants us to understand that and make sure we do that. And here there's, there's, there's quite a serious thing, really. Three times it says that the court sat and the books were opened. The book of my life. If the book of my life was opened before God, what is God going to see in my life? What is he going to see in your life? One day we will all stand before Jesus and give account of our lives. Um, never can as a will, we all will. And the only way that we can be confident at the end of time when Jesus returns and the day of judgment happens is if we've entrusted ourselves to Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. If we've done that, we can have confidence on that day. We don't need to be fearful. We don't need to be unsure. We know that God wants to accept us and receive us. 
But if, like me, for the first 21 years of my life, I've rejected God and kept him out, and I still want to be hostile to God, then let me tell you, I'm not going to get into heaven like that because there will be no sin. There will be no, um, there will be no wickedness. There will be nothing that is not anything other than pure, holy, perfect God himself. And so it's important that each one of us are ready for the day when the court sits, God opens the books of my life, of your life, of this church's life, and what is he going to read? And that's why the fourth point, final point is, of all these kingdoms we've been thinking about in Daniel 7, prioritize the kingdom of God. Prioritize the kingdom of Jesus. Because it's in Jesus alone. There is, I mentioned at the beginning of this service, I think, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So there is no way that we can get ourselves right with God. We need to allow Jesus to make us right with him. And he's done that by dying on the cross in our place. And so again, if there's anyone and you're not yet settled in your relationship with Jesus, I encourage you to do so. Um, that's what Daniel chapter 7 encourages us to do as well. Just be ready for the day, one day, when we will meet Jesus, our maker, face to face. And the f- summary points are all just up here on the, on the screen. Th- three different, uh, the three different kingdoms that Daniel 7 talks about, but actually the importance of prioritizing the kingdom of God. Prioritizing the kingdom of God. And the importance for each and every one of us to get ready, to be right with God. God's made it possible for us to be right with him. All we need to do is say, thank you, Jesus. Be willing to confess our sins and turn to him. And he longs to receive us and to accept us and to walk with us for the rest of our life on earth and into eternity as well. So let's just bow our heads in prayer. Let's just conclude. Let me just finish with a prayer. Just a moment for you maybe to gather your thoughts from this uh, interesting chapter, Daniel chapter 7. Is there anything particular God's saying to me or to you today? Father God, we thank you for this incredible vision that you gave to Daniel. And Lord, I pray like him, we too might receive a fresh vision of you, Jesus. Maybe if we've never had a vision of you, Jesus, would you, would you give us one, Lord? Something we know comes from you so that we, like Daniel, can be absolutely confident that we can put our faith in you. And Lord, if there are any areas you want to show us in our lives, anything you want to highlight, Lord God, may we allow you to do that, to search our hearts, to know our minds. And Lord, it's our thanks to you, Lord, for doing all that you've done at the cross to be able to make us be reconciled, be put right, made right with our maker. And we say thank you for that. And that's our prayer, Lord God, that each one of us might be ready whenever that day comes, when we stand before you and the books are opened. Father, thank you that you want to welcome us into heaven. And you've done everything to make that possible. We want to say thank you for that, Lord Jesus. Draw near to each one of us, we pray, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.